why do you think people are becoming more and more anxious? Let's go in the deep end. I think it's because society is becoming more and more stressful and life is becoming more and more stressful. So we have issues economically. Um, it used to be that you could have a traditional household with the male goes to work, female stays at home, looks after the children, you only need one income and you can afford to live comfortably. You can't do that anymore. You have to have two salaries at least. I saw an article recently that said throuples should be a thing because you have three salaries and you can actually afford to live comfortably. Wow. Um, so it, it means that you really need both people to go to work. So they're going to both have more added stress at home. You've got the financial stress of then sending children to nursery, which takes up most of one person's salary on an average salary anyway. Um, you've got social media. Social media is adding external pressures to everyone to look and feel and be a certain way because everyone portrays just the best in everything on there. Nobody tends to give realism. Um, and it people are always comparing themselves, comparing their lives. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. Everyone's becoming more unhappy because of the comparisons and then they're stressing, adding more pressure to themselves to achieve, to reach these goals that are really now much further out of reach than they might have been previously in previous generations. You've also got the added guilt of using things like normal toilet paper, which now we're being told don't use that because it uses bleach and that pollutes the environment and Everything you do has an added consequence. And there's just so much to think about. So I think that's why anxiety is a lot more prevalent now. Yes, I, I think that's an incredibly refreshing answer. You've given three really, I believe, non-superficial and poignant answers as opposed to the sort of answers that I get, which are things like, oh, COVID has been difficult and all these sort of niceties and sort of surface level just jargon that I think doesn't really have as much weight and I think you've you've especially well all, all three actually uh, I think that comparison is exceptionally damaging and it isn't just social media this I feel like there's more of a comparison currency or environment just in general life nowadays i mean obviously uh, i i don't know and i can't imagine and obviously you don't know either what what things were like back in the 50s but the whole metric of comparing yourself to other people has increasingly grown over the past particularly probably 20 years and obviously social media has a lot to do with that but I think there are there are probably other reasons behind that and maybe it's because society's been getting we're becoming more and more equipped and, and privileged to be fair because there are so many incredible things that we have at our, our disposal nowadays that just previous generations couldn't even dream of having and and maybe I'm a huge believer in when things kick out one end they will inevitably kick out another end and if things get better and better in some ways they will the the law of the universe will find a way to get unfortunately maybe worse and worse in other ways and you sort of create this enveloping monster of of a society where you've got extreme highs and extreme lows and it's a bit of a a dichotomy and and there's an argument that maybe that's not such a bad thing because maybe extreme highs and extreme lows is better than minimal highs and minimal lows i don't know it, that is that is up for conversation to be fair i'm sure a lot of people would argue it is and i also think there's the, the sort of the prevailing word that came out as you were speaking particularly when you're speaking about the household and the the finances is chaos Chaos is not something that's conducive with good mental health, is it? R most, like most of the time, chaos is quite damaging and sort of pernicious to people and and societies. As much as it's necessary, it's it, it's a problem. So, 
now we can do a sort of a little introduction thing. So what is it that you do, Luna, on a sort of daily basis that you feel qualifies you to, to speak about these sorts of things and gives you an insight into them? Well, I mean, I am qualified. And <laughs> I know. I mean, no, I'm not qualified. Like, yeah, but what stands me out from potentially other people is that I have done all of this myself. Um, I've worked through everything myself. So I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, anxiety, and depression as a teenager. And as much as I went to the doctor, they couldn't do anything about the fibromyalgia. I went to the pain clinic and all they said to me was, your self-efficacy is so high, there's nothing we can do. You're already functioning as much as you can. I thought, okay, well, that was a waste of time. Um, I tried lots of different medications, nothing worked. Um, if anything, it made me feel worse because it made me feel like a zombie. So things like pregabalin, gabapentin, the nerve blockers, amitriptyline, sertraline, citalopram, like everything. But being who I am, I don't like feeling like a zombie. And this is partly to do with the neurodivergence as well. I have never been diagnosed with it, but I know that my brain is different to neurotypical people because I've always been called weird. I've always thought very differently. And in more recent years, I've realized I have synesthesia, which I also thought was normal, but it's not. Um, so that basically means that when I think of people, they have a color. And my brain associates numbers and letters and countries with different colors and, and genders. And I thought that was normal, but it's not. Um, no. But yeah, so with the, the added parts of the neurodivergence, I like being creative i like being fast at doing things and with that comes these superpowers this empathy this ability to do things quickly it does cause anxiety sometimes but having that taken away and making me feel like a zombie was quite horrible i didn't like it it was like losing my sparkle and i really didn't like that so yeah. never took any of those medications in the end i just found a way to heal myself so i had a coach and that was where my journey to healing started. And I studied human biology at university, studied fibromyalgia, all the biological causes, which apparently there is none. It's more like correlation rather than causation. And I just kind of educated myself enough to heal myself. And that's now I can pass all of the knowledge and all of the tools that I used myself to my clients to help them do the same thing. Love it, love it. So, sort of enlighten me on what fibromyalgia and synesthesia is, because I've I've heard of fibromyalgia, but I haven't heard of synesthesia. So, let's, if you can, go into a little bit more depth of what those two conditions are, and then, and yeah, yeah, we'll we'll go from there. Yeah. So I'll start with the synesthesia. Um... It's just basically where your brain creates a, a cross in the wires. So it associates things with other things for no reason, basically. Um, you get different kinds. Mine is to do with people, <clears throat> mostly people. So if I think of a person, they have a color. But I need to know the person for them to have a color. I might know straight away, oh, you are this color. Because my brain just assigns it. I don't think about it. It's subconscious. Um, is it like... At the time, it can take longer for... Sorry, is it like the colour and the person are side by side or is it like the colour um, sort of overlaps the person and you see the person through the lens of the colour? How does it sort of... In the field of your imagination, how does it work? Is it words or visual? Maybe. I'm a very visual person, but I'm also a very feeling person. And the only way I can describe it is they just are. <laughs> so I am purple. I I don't see myself in my mind's eye as purple. I just am. And so my best friend, Jess, she's pink. Why is she pink? I don't know. Um, and when I found out that this was not normal... Um, I'll quickly tell you the story. I was just on a river boat with some people and I said to my friend, oh, you know how everyone has a colour? And she goes, no. 
I said, what do you mean? No, like when you think of someone, they have a color. She was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, that house over there, that's your color. But what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. And that's when I learned that it was, people don't think like that. But I just thought that was completely normal. And as I worked a bit more with people, um, there are a lot more people like me. But it does tend to be more neurodivergent people that are like that. Um, the way that our brains work, they just kind of cross cross wires. But also, when I worked at my old job and I discovered this, we started to look more into, okay, well, what could the colors mean? And someone mentioned auras. Why don't we look up the aura colors online to see if they match the personalities of the colors you've got for people? And they did. And that was very interesting. <laughs> So who knows what it is? It could just be, you know, I, I feel someone's energy, I feel their personality, and it comes out as they are just this color. I can't really explain it. Oh. Yes, no, I, I get that. I think there is, well, we have, there's there's a color frequency, isn't there? And there's a, there's a obviously a, what's it, electromagnetic spectrum of color, and there's also an energetic range of emotional frequency and it's all linked with color and waves and everything so it's perfectly possible that it's it's related to to something to do with that what's my color i'll see i don't know you well enough you don't know me well enough okay that's fair enough that's fair enough maybe, maybe at the end i'll ask them again okay. if it comes to you yeah but you haven't met me in real life either though so that's a different thing okay yes so and fibromyalgia, let's let's go into that as well. Yes. The fibromyalgia, um, it is a syndrome. It's a, a label that doctors use to describe a collection of different symptoms that have no cause that they know of. I know what the cause is. They don't know what the cause is. <laughs> oh. um, and so these symptoms include widespread muscular pain, joint pain, headache, depression, um, frequent urination, IBS, and uh, intestinal cramp. Have I missed anything? Those are the main ones. There's other things as well. Um, cold hands and feet is also one. But as you can see, there's such a wide range of different types of symptoms. Um, I think you have to have nine or more to be diagnosed. And there's also certain pressure points. I was obviously diagnosed a very long time ago because I'm old now, but um, so I was diagnosed as a teenager. I started suffering with this when I was 11 years old and they didn't diagnose me until I was 16. And after the diagnosis, it really didn't change much because they couldn't do much about it. Um, even though we tried different things, they couldn't do anything. But what it is, is chronic anxiety. It's your body being stuck in fight or flight mode. And I didn't realize as a child that I was stuck in fight or flight mode because of the family dynamic. And I had a great childhood. I had a great upbringing and there was nothing obviously wrong. But now with hindsight, I can see what was wrong. I can see that I was constantly stressed all the time. And my body was just breaking down because yeah. it couldn't cope with it. So when you're stuck in fight or flight mode for such a long time, you get adrenal fatigue because the cortisol constantly being pumped through your body, your kidneys and your adrenal glands just get tired and they run out of resources. And then it becomes very, very hard to wake up in the morning. So one of the, the key indicators as well is chronic fatigue. Uh, so you just can't wake up, you can't do anything. It becomes incredibly difficult. So I remember being in school, I was off sick a lot because I just couldn't get out of bed or my head was just so painful or, you know, I'd get stabbing pains in my ribs for no reason. And I thought that something would be wrong with my heart, but it wasn't. It was just that my muscles were so tight, my ribs couldn't expand. But even the doctors didn't know that. They would give me ibuprofen and tell me to go on my way. And I figured it out. I figured out that it was my muscles being tight so my ribs couldn't expand. So... Yeah, there's all of these things, but eventually working on my anxiety through coaching and CBT, I was able to then get out of fight or flight mode. 
And it was interesting that you mentioned COVID earlier because for me, COVID was a time of extreme personal growth and personal healing because I was forced to be alone. I lived by myself with my two cats and I worked the whole way through COVID, but I worked from home and I was just forced to be alone. And it it was something that I had never done before. I'd always kept very busy. I'd always burnt the candle at both ends. I'd always made sure I had plans with people and being slightly introverted and extroverted is like, I think it's called ambiverted. I would burn out a lot. But yeah, during COVID, I had to sit still and I had to sit with myself and with my thoughts. And as someone who did suffer at the time with anxiety and depression, it was quite difficult. But instead of crying about it, I got a coach and worked on things and truly transformed my life. After I started to do that, my fibromyalgia symptoms got much, much, much better because I was able to rest as well. When your body's stuck in the fight or flight mode for such a long time, you will then have this period of time as you come out of it when you just crash physically. You will just need to rest so much to regain all of that energy you've lost, to replenish the body's resources, to get your digestive system back into working order. Um, And it, it does take a while. But if you give yourself grace during that period of time, you can then get out of it. It's if you start to beat yourself up and get back into fight or flight mode, you're going to end up starting that cycle again. So, yeah, that's that's what fibromyalgia is and how I kind of got... <laughs> that, was, that was a very thorough answer. You, you covered all bases there. And it, the, when you were listing out those symptoms, that really does sound like someone who's in chronic, at least sounds like it could easily be related in some way to someone who's in maybe there's something another sort of offset and it's the combination of those two things that can cause it to happen who knows but all the symptoms you you listed there were very very sort of textbook uh prolonged use of like adrenal and and cortisol um exemption so that that does make complete sense to be fair you mentioned the family dynamic growing up. You said that you had a very happy childhood, but it was possibly a result of a family dynamic. What what was that family dynamic? What do you mean by that? Obviously, with what you're comfortable talking about. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, if my parents see this, sorry, but I just, that's, they, they love the parents. They did a really good job. Um, good. Me and my brother have the same parents. My sister has a different dad to us, but um, we all get along very well. But my parents bickered a lot, so it was always very high-level stress all the time. My dad is a massive perfectionist. He's got a lot better with age, um, and both my parents were quite emotionally stunted in that we weren't really allowed to show sadness or anger at home. Anger was more acceptable than sadness. But they had three very highly emotional, highly sensitive children. So it must have been quite difficult for them to deal with that because they don't know how to deal with their own emotions. Um, On top of that, my mum is narcissistic and would often comment on our weight, how we looked, who we are, we were almost competing against each other for attention and love um especially me and my brother because there's a smaller age difference he was well he is very intelligent but then i am also very intelligent and we're intelligent in different ways he's very logical and i'm very creative um but yeah because of that dynamic and constantly being put down and told you weren't good enough you then kind of take on that belief of you're not good enough and then that caused a lot of anxiety for me personally because I would always think I was a useless waste of space and why am I here and what's the point because I just upset everyone all the time and everything I do is wrong and it didn't matter how much I achieved I went to a very high achieving school so again in terms of comparison even though I was very very intelligent I was average at that school my brother went to a different school to me that was not such a highly successful achieving school. So he was at the top of the class for everything. 
So that was a bit different as well. Um, but yeah, we, um, we all kind of have the same self-worth issues from, from the family dynamic and the same kind of anxieties all presenting just slightly differently. So that was the dynamic, despite the fact that we were, you know, financially completely stable. We had everything we could run materially. We did not have the support we needed emotionally. Yes, of course. And given, as you said, uh, if you're a, a sensitive child, then you really need that sort of compassionate and aware, emotional, mature figure in your life to help you navigate that. And that's obviously uh, an incredibly difficult thing if you weren't given that as much as, as you could have been. Are you the oldest um, sibling? No, my sister is 10 years older, so I'm actually quite grateful to have had her as almost like a second mother. She talked to us a lot when we were growing up. Um, then our mum 100% has undiagnosed ADHD. She, one of those people that's like, I'm always so busy, but you, I don't know what you do. <laughs> yeah. um, constantly getting distracted all the time, always talking over people. Um, always stressed, always emotional outbursts. Like it does seem like very severe ADHD and she would never have had any help with that or even any recognition that she had that. Yeah. Um, so I can understand how that could have been quite difficult for her, but that meant that me and my sister had to step up and be the women of the household in a way. And my brother had to had to also contribute. We did a lot of the housework, um, most yeah. of it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, my mum would use us as emotions more as well. So. Yeah, but there's a. I suppose the the point of a parental unit or a parental dyad is to create a balanced and supportive foothold or safeguard for their children that they could go and go out, go on and having which is why the idea of the nuclear family as much as it's fallen out of favor nowadays and considered to be oppressive or etc 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 and and uh limiting there is definitely merit in that idea and in the sense of as much as not everyone can abide by it that's fine not everyone has to abide by it it's not the only way of making things work but there is logic behind why that possibly rose to the norm and but the thing is is reality isn't as limited as that reality involves all the complications and the nuances of people that come with people so when you're just putting two people together creates so many sort of overlapping dynamics and and you get offshoots and offspurts of different things all over the place and when people have children i can imagine i i'm i'm sure it's maybe it's probably a rare child that hasn't sort of engaged in some sort of turn taking with their parents because at the end of the day I'm not I'm not um diminishing what you're talking about it at all but I'm just saying that maybe it's helpful because it gives a child a window into being mature it, it matures them because it puts them on the boundaries of their capability which is ultimately how we we grow in life but I can imagine that was a tricky situation for you for you to navigate and but at the same time, having an older sister, hopefully that, that was helpful. And also another thing that I think isn't spoken about enough is parental jealousy onto their children. And I think that's particularly toxic with mums and their daughters. My mum had a... Sorry, grandma. But she was... A, yeah, oh well, she doesn't listen to them. But she she was a very narcissistic growing up. And my mum being the eldest daughter and the only daughter... My my uncle was the golden child because he was a boy, and and she was she was a girl, and there was an awful lot of bullying 
And I do think jealousy, especially as she got a bit older and sort of became a teenager and a young adult, there's that whole sort of Snow White um, and evil witch archetype playing out with a mother and a daughter that I think can happen, that, that jealousy. And it, and it's something that isn't spoken about in society at all. And I, and I think it probably should be spoken about. So do you, when you look back now, obviously as a, as an, an adult, can you try and sort of understand that as much as that was you as a child and you're no longer a child? Cause I, I, I really, it's such, it's so awful when people, experience childhood trauma or adverse childhood experiences because they get stuck in that you know we use the term inner child our inner child gets stunted and I guess coming from someone who was fortunate enough to not really have any of that at least not from my parents I had my own difficulties but it wasn't through parenting I'm able to I kind of think my naive and ignorant mind goes yeah but you're not a child anymore you're an adult you're an adult you're a completely different person to who you are then and I understand that that's not how it works but I do think that maybe as much as you can carry that idea forward with you not you in general not you but just in general there is merit in that way of thinking I'm now an adult my brain is under my control with as much as possible as as it can be therefore this maybe this doesn't have to impact me as much do you understand what i'm saying i'm not i'm not i'm just not being insensitive but i'm I, I'm, I, I'm not trying to be insensitive i never am but do you kind of get how letting not letting go but understanding that progression and change is really important as you get older dis- differentiating that yeah. I've had this conversation with a couple of people in the past, so I, I, I understand what you mean. Um, what I said to them, and I'll try and say it in the same way because it seemed to land with them, was it's our responsibility as an adult to understand and discover the patterns we built as a child for survival because as a yeah. child our survival was being loved and then as an adult learn new survival patterns and let go of the ones we don't need anymore so it's like rewriting our life script and being able to reprogram our minds to let go of the things that are no longer serving us so while some people say well there's no point digging into the past I'm not a child anymore and it's not going to help me it helps you by understanding who you are where you've come from why you built those patterns being consciously aware of them and then unlearning them. Yeah, Just... clearly. No, that could be answers. Is it? Yeah, that that's what it is, and that's that is. It's a perennial. It's an inevitable fact of life. Is that you will have children, and in some ways you will make mistakes, and even if you have the most securely attached child ever you will do something wrong and that's actually good because you need to do something wrong because that's how we grow as individuals and that's how we calibrate ourselves is by having those things going wrong and then learning how we can overcome them late later in life and and that is yeah. you know that is a that's part of the adventure of life and that's part of well it is just it is just going to happen so and it's not even a bad thing that's going to happen. It's not a pessimistic outlook that I don't think. Because one answer to life is to shield yourself away from all that is wrong and bad. And the other answer is to arm yourself with the ability to face what is wrong and bad. And the latter is probably the better outcome, really. Because it's better to be stronger and vulnerable than shielded and weak. I think, at least. Let's I talk... agree with you. Good. Yeah. Sorry, carry on. 
I was just going to say the the more you go through as a child, the more resilience you have as as an adult, definitely. But there's there's a balance. You don't want to have to go through loads and loads of hardship. The most important thing you can do as a parent is just to provide love and support. You're never going to get everything right. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's a perfect person. Nobody's a perfect human. Nobody's a perfect parent. And you will do things wrong. And I don't blame anybody. I don't blame my parents. Everyone acts through the lens of their own trauma and their own hurt and their own survival mechanisms. And so all we can do is our best. But I think love and support is the most important thing if you want to help someone learn and grow. Yeah, love and support. Love and truth, I think. Or at least truth is a complicated one because is a white lie bad but then the answer to that is well is there a deeper truth that sits below the white lie that you should that is more important that you should uphold so therefore telling the white lie if telling the white lie maintains the deeper truth then i mean that gets complicated then because then you move into the realm of like the set you can you can justify deception and stuff like that but so it is a complicated thing to navigate but there's there's definitely there's definitely something in that so yeah i wouldn't say truth you think truth is subjective you think all truth is subjective for example okay no but there is fact and then there is opinions and someone's opinion is their truth Yes, there, there is, there is, there, it is the case that, as you use the term lens, it's even, it isn't even lens. It's actually deeper than that. We don't even see the world through a lens. We see the world. I don't know what the and, and the most accurate analogy is. We omit, we leave things out, and highlight things through the field of our of our mind. It isn't the case that. We all see the world the same. It then goes into our brain. We put it through our own little filtering mechanism and then we, we process it. It's actually the case that we actually see the world is a different place, literally, to every single every single one of us. It's like we all view the world with a slightly different shade of grey or of some colour, which is hence why we keep walking hence why we keep uh bumping into each other quite catastrophically and bumping into problems all the time because we actually don't see the same world as each other and it's a real problem if we don't understand that and utilize it the way it needs to be utilized and the way it needs to be utilized is by speaking to each other because that's how that's the only way we can get through that's the only way we can even get a glimpse of the way other people see the world is by speaking to each other because otherwise it's just it's really hard even if you're a very intelligent very sensitive very uh experienced person it is hard it's to see the world in someone else's shoes so to speak but truth being subjective well yeah I do think that there must be some truth so that we all have to abide by because otherwise we're in hot water do you not think yes yeah I would say those are the facts those are the facts the facts that are true we can hold on to those like the laws of physics that's a fact we all have to abide by the laws of physics. Yeah. But if someone tells you no one's ever going to love you if you're not super skinny, that's not truth. That's their truth. Yeah. That's their opinion. Well, it might not even be... telling you the truth. Yeah. It might not even be their truth. It might be some spirit that is inhabiting them that they've let control them. That is that they're imparting onto you some like the way that we all have sort of multiple different like inside out have you seen the film inside out 
So we all have this. Person, how's this? How's this? Okay. here. That is good. We all have these mini sub personalities that take that try and grab hold of the reins from time to time, and it isn't it isn't necessary that we are those sub personalities. We we are well, we're something we're something else. The the common answer to that is we're the awareness behind them, but yes, I agree that that is their truth. How do you think? being a woman and sort of processing neurodivergence how has that sort of impacted you because it's a bit of a stigma stigma isn't it at least in part and it's it's not as diagnosed obviously i know you haven't been diagnosed you 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 self-diagnosed which is possibly just as accurate as a an official diagnosis with someone as sort of experienced as as you but how what's your opinion on I know it's a bit of a, a sort of a rogue, vague question, but what's your opinion on societal's expectations on men with neurodivergence and because uh, and then uh, and then women and maybe boys and girls? Do you have any sort of opinions on that? Do you have any experience in how that's been, or not really? Um. Yes. So. I feel that it will mostly affect people in school, to be honest. So boys with uh, ADHD, for example, will act out. Everything will be externalized. They'll get up. They'll be disruptive. It will be noticed because they're not conforming. And they're disrupting everybody else. And so then because it's noticed by other people, they will get diagnosed. They will get treatment. They will get support. Females, girls in school, it's all internalized. They're daydreaming. They're not paying attention. They're not focusing, but you don't know because they're conforming to the rules and behaving themselves seemingly from the outside. Yeah. And looking back now, I can see I always did that. I was constantly daydreaming. I'm always away with the fairies. Being a Pisces woman as well, extra away with the fairies. Um, But because... I have a very fast brain. I'd also have this thing where I can pick up part of what's been said and fill in all the blanks correctly. So if I was in school, I'd pick up one part of what the teacher said, figure out the rest of what they had just said, and then I I was fine. That's how I would catch up with the conversation. Mm. Um, If I didn't know what to do, I would just ask, and then they'd tell me in one sentence, and I wouldn't have to pay attention to 20 minutes of them talking, you know? So... Those sorts of things people wouldn't necessarily pick up on. I remember one time I was daydreaming so much, someone threw a pen at me. (laughs) That this completely broke me out of this daydream that I didn't even know I was doing. They were like, why are you daydreaming? And I was like, I'm sorry. So that was the only person that ever noticed that I was daydreaming away in class and didn't didn't pay attention. Um, But I got good grades. I still got everything fine, but there was a... A boy in my year that had ADHD and he was extremely disruptive until he started taking medication and he finally sat still. So I think that in school is the main the main issue, but the problem is then if you if you don't notice it throughout school and you get into your adult life and you get a job, it's then gonna start to affect you more. So in previous jobs that I've had I had a massive need to people please. So I'd go into roles that would be helpful to other people and I'd get this sense of achievement every time I helped someone else, which is fine, but then that means you start taking on every bit of everyone else's work because you're a yes person. Yes, I can do this. Yes, I can do that. I can do everything. You have no boundaries, basically. Yeah. Uh, this is a lot of neurodivergent people because they experience rejection sensitivity dysphoria, which means that if you are rejected, you get extreme emotional response that actually feels painful. Because of that, you become a people pleaser and then you don't have any boundaries because you just want to give your energy to everyone else, keep them happy so that they don't reject you. Do you think that was one thing that I was actually going to talk to you about, to be fair, is that the people pleasing because I thought that was very interesting to talk about. Do you think that your people-pleasing originated 
at least partially from your your sort of requirement to placate and pander to your to your mum growing up in order for her to feel good and the only way that you could feel good was when she felt good so you therefore had to do everything you could in your power to make her feel good and you carried that through with with you in life do you think that there's that that i mean i'm sure there is a link even if you don't think there is to be honest but do you do you think that there is that is uh associated in some way correlated and it's not just my mum it is also my dad because he was a massive perfectionist and because my mum had possible ADHD most likely she would walk through a room like the Tasmanian devil and mess everything up my dad was so organized and structured and perfectionist he wanted to have a show home so together this is why they were bickering so much because they're just opposite ends that is not me. So me and brother and sister would have to just navigate through this constant chaos of bickering and have it this way, have it this way, um, trying to find things and then put things away and then placate two very different ends of the spectrum of parents. Completely. So that's where the people pleasing came from. I didn't want them to bicker anymore. Yes. So... And I didn't want my brother to get in trouble as well because he kind of went the opposite way and became very rebellious, whereas I became a people pleaser. Yeah. And I didn't want him to get in trouble, so I'd start doing part of his share of the housework as well to keep everyone happy and everyone calm. And there came a point where I was old enough to um, cook nice meals, so I was like uh, 14 or something, Um me and my brother had cooked a lot of our own food since we were kids. We were given like a timer. Mum would put something in the oven and give us a timer and we'd have to take it out because she'd get so distracted she'd forget to take it out otherwise. But once I learned how to cook properly, my dad would come home and he'd always complain that dinner was never ready and he'd always get grumpy. And so I ended up taking that on board. And I didn't do it all the time, but a lot of the time I would then, I'll make dinner because mum's off no like doing whatever I don't know so I would make dinner and it would be to people please to keep the peace to stop the argument and that came through in all of my relationships then from then on yeah no that that makes sense I can just imagine just had this sort of vision of like these two polarities pulling against each other and just creating this port sort of environment that you found yourself that you found yourselves in and yeah it's inevitable that you were gonna as you said sort of go one way or the other how have you later in life how have you sort of overcame that at least uh, at least to some degree I, I hope you, I you know I hope you have um because it can be exceptionally detrimental so what sort of thought patterns and processes and behaviors did that you did you implement to start to maybe I don't know shed the the skin of feeling the need to people please all the time I had to learn to say no that was incredibly difficult for me to say no to people because then it was a case of if I say no they will hate me because then I'm useless so it was this thing of, if I'm not useful, I'm not loved. If I'm not useful, people don't want me around. And so I would people please, not only to keep the peace, but to keep people around. So learning to say no to people and understanding that if I said no to them and they did leave, they didn't actually like me. They just liked what I could do for them. Very true. That was a really important thing to learn. But when I first started to learn to say no, I did it in the workplace because for me, working relationships were so much less important than friendships family or relationships so it's much easier to start learning in the workplace where I could you know start with really subtle things so for example someone came to ask me to do something and I was in the middle of my own task I'd say to them give me five minutes and then I'll come and see you so it wasn't even a no it was just setting a very small boundary yeah and then it grew a bit more so it was Send me an email and I get to it when I can. So again, a slightly bigger boundary, but still not a no. And then eventually I started saying 
no, I don't have capacity for that because we're already doing too much. Mm. People didn't like it. <laughs> and um, I did, I ended up getting bullied in the workplace, like corporate bullying, because I changed so much as a person. I wasn't being unhelpful, but I understood that I had my own workload to do. I also became a manager, which meant that I had even more workload to do, and I couldn't just be doing everything for everyone else all the time. And there were certain people that didn't like that and then caused a lot of issues. So I ended up leaving, but that's that's kind of how I started to learn to do it. And then there were some friends. So it, it, I branched out to some friends saying, well, no, actually, I'm not going to do that for you. Like, that would be out of my way to do that. And those sorts of people just kind of fell away organically when I started to say no to things. I am very lucky to have really amazing friends like I have such beautiful wonderful friends but there are these accessory friends that weren't like super good friends and they had started to try try and come in and noticed I was really nice and ready to take advantage but they all fell away um in my relationships like it massively affected me because I just ended up with narcissistic people all the time so I've had two long-term relationships and they were both narcissistic. One was an overt narcissist. One was a covert narcissist. You think you know what to look for and then you realize there's different kinds. Um, but yeah. it was after these two relationships that I started my personal growth and my coaching and, and learning everything. So even now, I still sometimes attract narcissists, but I can notice and I will immediately shut that down put those boundaries in and if they don't react well to the boundaries and they try to turn things around on me i can recognize that and i say okay no nope. yeah so yeah and the people pleasing the main thing is building boundaries and learning to say no to people and that take that does take courage though doesn't it and it takes it's a leap of faith because to give up something that you've that has effectively at least subconsciously you believe has maintained you to some degree growing up you had to let that go is 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 a is a as i said it's a leap of faith and it takes bravery but it is so worth it isn't it because i i really the, the that was a great term and all use of words accessory friends i think that's really good these people because you will I've noticed it because because I'm temperamentally a very agreeable person and it upsets me deeply when I think that I have done wrong by someone or not helped them or to some degree I'm getting better as I get older and it was probably never it was never as strong as it could have been to be fair I do think that part of that is because I'm because I'm a man I think there's it is easier for men to be more to be less to be more disagreeable because men are less safety concerned than women are women are far more safety concerned so it makes sense for women to be people pleasers because they need they want to feel safe and that that means they're vulnerable to manipulation and coercion but i do find that people like to pigeonhole you and they put you in a box of they're they're a good person they'll do what you want from them as long as you're kind of nice with them they'll they'll do what you want and then when you push back on that it flips and they're a bit like this isn't who you are this isn't who I thought you were and they get sort of angry a little bit because they were sort of engaged in this even if they were quite nice to you it doesn't make them a bad I'm not saying these people are bad people it just it highlights just how complicated human relationships are because they do sort of tend to go well this is a bit of a shock this is not who I thought you were. I've been being kind to you because I thought you were slightly on the back foot a little bit, maybe. And I thought that you, but at the same time, we were kind of engaged in this sort of transactional relationship where I was kind of nice to you and you would kind of help me. And But once they see that maybe you're not quite as, I don't want to say weak, I say meek, maybe. Meek is a good word. They're a little bit taken aback and... Yes, that that is 
because it's I often ask myself to what degree are relationships transactional is it completely because some of the time I do think it is completely even with friendships I'm like and I I wonder if we spoke about right at the beginning we were speaking about how the the currency is slightly different nowadays as a comparison currency and I think there's also more of a transactional currency among people nowadays than there maybe was a hundred years ago and maybe that's because we you know as i said earlier it's because we have that we have a far greater uh accessibility and opportunity now so therefore that transactional capacity has grown in relationship to that but do you do you is that something you've asked yourself before how transactional are these relationships that i'm engaged in and and how do i know if it's it's genuine because at the end of the day that maybe transactional is kind of the wrong word because if you're an asshole all the time to your friends then they probably shouldn't be friends with you and they shouldn't give you anything in return so you do kind of want it to be slightly transactional in a healthy way but it's just navigating that when it goes off the edge of this is far too one-sided so what's your opinion on that sort of phenomenon i have been thinking about this a lot recently actually because i had a similar friendship that was very transactional but from my side there was a lot of love like a lot a lot of love and from the other side, I know there was a lot of love, but as soon as I said, I'm not going to do these things for you anymore, it flipped. Just like you said, it flipped. And as I've been thinking about it with other friendships in my life, the transaction is just love and support. And I suppose that is a transaction because you want love and support from both sides to each other. I'm going to support you in this and then you're going to be there for me in that. And that is transactional. And if one of you is an asshole, you're not holding up your end of the transaction. You're not going to make them feel happy anymore. So you don't want to do that anymore. But when it becomes a material transaction, I think that's when it becomes possibly negative because it's like, I only love you because you're doing these material things for me. It's not like if you're not doing them anymore, I'll still love you and we'll still hang out and We'll still meet up for coffee or catch up or have a phone call or whatever. It's like, no, you stopped doing that material thing. So I'm going to take away all my love and I'm not going to see you anymore. And that's when it's narcissistic. So narcissists have purely transactional relationships that purely come down to how useful is this person to me? What can they do for me? And like you said, the more meek the person is, the more malleable they are the more the narcissistic person is going to like them and the more the meek person is going to become molded and become anxious to please the other person because they know as soon as they don't or as soon as they express a boundary the other person flips and the love goes and oh it's suddenly a problem and but they're the problem yeah that's how the narcissistic relationships generally work but i would say most if not all well all relationships are transactional to a degree but it's is it emotional transaction is it healthy love transaction or is it materialistic i'm going to take this away if you don't do that for me transactional yeah is is it sort of is there jeopardy is there enforced jeopardy jeopardy over what it is that it or isn't being given and or withdrawn in a relationship which is which is which is the key i think that's a good place to semi-stop but i'm going to ask you the final question um which yeah we'll um see if you have an answer some people don't and that's absolutely fine it's called the breaking point podcast i didn't even i haven't really explained why because partially i'm interested in like people sort of maybe lowest moments or even highest moments where they have then gone on to make a change or they gone on to undergo some sort of drastic shift in the way that they see themselves or the world 
Can you think of one moment where you were at an exceptionally low point or a high point and you said, I need to make a change or I need to do something differently or I've been doing this wrong? Does anything come to mind? I've had many, many low points just that I can think yeah. of. But I would probably say the end of my last proper relationship was a very low point for me and it ignited me wanting to look after myself a bit better. So yeah. going, starting to exercise, eating better, learning more about nutrition. 2019 that was, and that was quite a transformational year for me. And then 2020 is when I started with my coach. So since 2019, my growth over the last five years has been exceptional and I feel like a completely different person. I was the most people pleasing me, no boundaries, depressed, like victim you could have ever met. Even though I was a really nice person, that was what I was, a nice person, and I didn't have much identity or know who I was beyond that. So, yeah, that the end of that relationship was kick-started. All of these things that have happened over the last five years, I think. 